So uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Holy Jess and Vasily, for the help and feedback but for my slides and for giving me the opportunity to share this with you uh, and enjoy Moscow, uh, such a wonderful city. I love it. I want to, to be back, and I'm still here. So, espasiva. <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid this is everything I know, so don't, uh, don't ask me on Russian yet, still. Maybe the next talk, okay? So I'm Miguel Angel Duran. That's my happy face when I do front-end development. I'm a, a guy that loves performa web performance. So that's my happy face, especially when I'm getting good metrics of performance in my websites. And if you don't want to know more about me and the things that I do and I share, uh, you could find me on Twitter and YouTube as Midudev. I usually post my videos in Spanish, but I don't imagine a better way to learn Spanish in case that you want to go on vacation there. Uh, because, yeah, I'm from Spain. More exactly, I'm from Barcelona. That's almost uh, more than 4,000 kilometers away. Uh, it's like five hours on a flight, but I can't encourage you enough to go visit Barcelona and enjoy our weather uh, there and our food. So if you have questions about Barcelona and not only about performance and React, uh, they are welcome as well. So what I'm doing there in Barcelona, uh, so as... Uh, I mentioned I'm Enabler Frontend at Adevinta. Enabler is like a, a platform team because at Adevinta we have so different marketplaces and products, and we have to make sure that every product is following the same rules. Okay, so if we have a marketplace that is solving the problems with server-side rendering, uh, we have to make sure that the rest of marketplaces are using the same rules. Adevinta. It's a worldwide market leader in online classifieds. We have marketplaces around the globe with uh, so many different topics like jobs, real estate, or even cars. Uh, in fact, the nearest product that the company I work for have from here is QFAR. Is anyone from Belarus? No? Well, some, someone? Okay. Do you know QFAR? Yes? Nice. So <laughs> we hope to be uh, soon in Russia as well, so you know Kufar. But uh, Kufar is a generalist marketplace based on Belarus. But uh, anyway, in our company, we are working with several libraries and technologies uh, around the globe with all the different marketplaces. But there is especially one library that is taking the lead. So now that you know me, I would like to, to ask you something, okay? I invite you to scan this QR code or enter the URL that is below in order to access a quick poll, a real-time poll, so that, uh, nothing wrong could happen. And there you will find a quick question to know what front-end library are you using in your developments right now. It's quick and it won't identify you and your result and the data will be removed as soon as the Lambda is shut down. So don't worry, you don't need anything. It's like, wow, that's fast, wow. Awesome. So, yeah, uh, don't be shy. The, the angular person that is <laughs> it's high, just both. I, that's it. Congratulations. So, yeah, perfect. You are in the right place. I see that React is winning. Oof. <laughs> I thought to hack the real-time poll in case that you don't vote for React. But, well, I'm happy to see that uh, everyone is, is voting React. Uh, I see that... Now the, the, the people is trolling the, the Angular thing. Okay, we're going to stop it. Uh, the, the thing is that we could see that uh, React is uh, mainly the, 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 the typical front end library right now that we are using in our front end developments. Thanks for, thanks for particip participating. So in Spain, as I said, we have different marketplaces. One of it is a, a real estate marketplace called Photocasa. And we decided to use React as well, obviously. And we had a .NET framework uh, with a monolith architecture. And we wanted to separate backend and frontend. And for the latter, uh, using good separation of layers with domain-driven design on a frontend, containers, components. And so after 
a lot of good work to check performance. Uh, we noticed that the mobile user experience, even after the, the coupling step, wasn't nice enough, okay? The result was pretty painful. So we use Lighthouse to get a photo of the status of the performance of our website, and every performance metric was read on February 2019. And that is after moving to React. Uh, and it was like a, a surprise, okay? We realized that the new architecture offered the same or even worse experience than the old one. So seeing these scores had a great impact on us. This score, the global score, goes from zero to 100, and we score 19. The score is calculated by using other metrics, uh, the user experience, and these get different weights depending on how important are they. So for example, one important is uh, speed index. It's important. And this metric tells you how fast is the perception that your website uh, is visually completed. And in our case, as you can see, was very low. But there is still another metric that is even more important. And that's the critical that's critical for the user to be able to use your product. That's the time to interactive, and we score with a one, uh, which is a shame. I don't know even if <laughs> there is a zero or negative values, but <laughs> it was like uh, we can't score lower than this. So let me explain to you a little bit more about time to interactive. Uh, some sites uh, optimize content visibility at the expense of interactivity. This could create a frustrating user experience. The site appears to be there because you can see that something is rendered on your browser, like this example, this is comic strip, that you see a store that is painted on the wall, but when the user tries to use it, then nothing happens because the site is not interactive yet. In some cases, that could be very frustrating because it could be a problem for some seconds. So if you try again, you smash again. Then suddenly, the page becomes usable and the user is able to interact with it. The amount of the time passed from the time to first byte to the point when the page is completely usable is called time to interactive. So in February 2019, Photocasa, the real estate marketplace, needed 15 seconds in order to get our website to respond. So let's check a quick video in order to show you what this means. You could see that while some buttons are visible, if I try to press them, nothing is happening. It's like we are on hold while the app is fully rendered on the client. So for 15 seconds, our users couldn't do anything in our website. No searches, no apply filters, uh, no leads. And that, that wasn't fine for us, okay? So after all the effort of moving to a new front-end architecture with React, we didn't want to ask ourselves loud, but then definitely we had to. So we asked ourselves, is React slow? So we started to investigate, profile, and most important, understand the cost and impact of every component we were rendering on our site. So we started to a research into limiting the cost of rehydration will ultimately lead to a better experience for end users thanks to some strategies. On February, as I mentioned, we started with this performance score. And that's today. Now, I understand it's far from perfect that there's plenty of things to do, but right now, the thing is that our problem, the problems that we are facing in terms of performance are not longer related to React. Uh, but there are other things like third-party scripts that I'm pretty sure that that's a problem that we are facing, all, for all of us. Using Optimizely as AV testing library, tons of dependencies that we need in order to show advertisement. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I could prepare a whole talk about all of it, maybe for Holy GS 2020, St. Petersburg, who knows? But I want today to talk about how we improve our performance score, especially the time to interactive, 
by using two different strategies with React. And in this graph, you could see the direct impact those had on the time to interactive by cutting down more than three seconds. So welcome to React rendering strategies, strategies to get the most out of performance while keeping bots and crawlers happy. First, we have to understand the problem. And I'm pretty happy because I saw the, uh, the and I enjoyed the Guillermo Rauch talk. It was amazing. Uh, and I'm happy because I see that the problem that we are facing, it's something that is now worldwide. I mean, everyone is facing the same problem. And Guillermo and Said has some cool solutions for it. And we have another strategy that I want to share with you. The problem that Guillermo mentioned is that right now, do stuff on the client is expensive. Not only on the client as well on the, ser on the server, but on the client is especially expensive because you can't control the device where you are rendering your uh, site or your application. So let's do a quick recap about rendering on the web. We have the server-side rendering. Uh, we have is the old but gold uh, server-side rendering, where the server fetches the data and creates a string HTML after some process by uh, using some server-side language like PHP or .NET. You could even use React on the server, like Netflix does, for example, in order to send the render app from the server. And then on the client, you could use some library like jQuery or Vanilla.js in order to just uh, add some events or some interactivity. This is great for time to interactive, as the amount of JavaScript that you need on the client normally is, a sm is a small. And I say normally. And what you are doing is to render new content on the client just by patching your already server HTML. Also, the first contentful pane is quick because you are sending the HTML at once from the server and it doesn't need to render or paint new elements. But normally, the problem is the slow time to first byte and that you have to maintain different code bases. That's the most used strategy right now in order to serve apps because WordPress is the leader of the, of the ways of showing uh, websites. I, it's, in fact, it has like the 33% 33, 33 of the market share. So as you can imagine, it's normal that the server-side rendering is the lead now. You have the static rendering that Guillermo mentioned. It's a technique that is lately very popular as it comes with great performance benef benefits as what you are doing is just serving a static file and there is nothing more uh, quick than just a static file. You could achieve this with frameworks like Gatsby or even Next.js with the export option or the new options that Guillermo mentioned and with this, you are going to obtain amazing performance improvements in every metric as there is nothing faster. Still, there's a problem and that is inflexible. For us, that we are marketplaces and we have millions and millions of listing pages, imagine with all the filters, and we want to be near real time because when the user is uploading or posting a new ad or a new car or a new real estate, they want to see it on the site, but in a few seconds. So for us, the static rendering is not a solution. The problem as well is that static rendering is not perfect. It's not a silver bullet because sometimes you need still uh, some things that you have to do on the client as well, like hydration that we are going to talk about this later. We have the client side rendering. This is another technique. It has been around for a long time, but now it's even more popular thanks to React or Vue. And this technique is awesome because it's very flexible. It has some benefits of performance for the time to first byte, the first content full page, uh, and it's just static files as well. The problem is that time to interactive is happening way after the first content full paint, and that is not uh, search engine optimization friendly, okay? And that's a problem for us as well because we are a marketplace and we need the crawlers to crawl us. So the client side rendering on React is something like this. It's just uh, calling the method render of React DOM and passing the component that you want to render and the container as a second argument 
where you want to render your app. Now, we found some things in order to try to get the best of two, the two worlds, the client side rendering and the server side rendering, with the server side rendering with rehydration. And, but it has some problems, right? This technique is we have the HTML from the server. We have to send all the data that we use on the server to render this app. Then we have the app on, on, the, on the browser, but still it's not interactive. It's just static. That's like the first comic strip that we have seen. And this iteration data that we are sending along with the static HTML, it looks something like this. It's a huge JSON file that we have to send over from the server. And to achieve this, we have, this is a simplified way to, to do this, okay? So we have the server side. This is the code on the server side. We are getting the initial data that we need. We are just uh, rendering to a string, the whole app, passing as a pro the initial data. And we are sending to the server, uh, to the client, uh, sorry, the HTML rendered and all the initial data that we are using and we are sending to the client. So on the client, we are going to be able to hydrate as well the same application because we have to use exactly the same data that we have been using on the server to render on the client the application. Okay. Now, the hydration. What is that? That is like uh, initializing in our application, in our client application, the same application we render on the server, but reusing the static HTML that we are returning from the server, okay? So we are not able, we are not, we are not gonna need to re-render on the client the same application. This is not something that is happening only on React as well, because you have the same option on Vue. And obviously, it has a cost in terms of uh, the threat of JavaScript because you have to attach the event listeners to the existing markup. You have to check the mismatches between server side and client side. You have to recreate the tree on the virtual DOM in order to be able to check on compare between the differences and be able to update the DOM and set up the lifecycle sorter and fire them. So. Just to sum up, it's something like the HTML, the static HTML that we are sending from the server, we are transforming it to dynamic DOM to react to client-side data changes or even user events. With some drawings, it's something like this. We have from the server the static app. We call this method hydrate. It takes a while because it has to do some things. And then we have an interactive app on the client side. And this is the last comic street that we have seen before. Now, we have different options now with, for, with frameworks for Vue, React, or Angular in order to achieve this. And you don't have to worry about the implementation details that we have seen. Anyway, the question about this technique is, are we getting the best of the client side rendering? and server-side rendering? Or are we getting the worst of, the, of both? Because if we see the worst of both, is that we are getting a slow time to first byte, and we are getting a bad time to, to, in, time to interactive that is happening way after the first contentful pane. So I want to show you a quick demo about this technique, the server-side rendering, to see the cost that has on the client even rendering on the server the application. I have a demo with the different strategies, and this is the first one. So I'm going to just uh, refresh this with the performance tab. I'm going to say 6x, like a mobile phone. And let's profile this. I have. So if we check this, we could see that the, on the client, even rendering on the server the application, we are getting on the client one second 
of cost, okay? And that means that at least our application is gonna get a time to interactive of one second. And this is a very simple application, right? We could see here the cost of every component that we are rendering. We could see the whole tree of React components. And as the application is a list of articles, you could see the cost of every article that we are rendering, okay? So the first one usually is the most expensive one because we have to start and put on memory some of the components and the dependencies that we are using. And the second one is using uh, half of the time of the first one. But the problem is that you could think, okay, React is fast because to render a car is taking only 35 milliseconds, and that's nothing. But the problem is when you have a listing with a few results, like, I don't know, 50 results, so you only have to multiply uh, 35 milliseconds uh, by 50. And that's what is happening here. The thing is the whole listing page is taking like almost one second. Okay, so remember the one second cost of this. Okay, this is the one second. And we could check if we go to the source code. You could, you could check the whole HTML, static HTML. So this is being rendered on the server. And the ugly JSON object that I mentioned before with all the data that used on the server in order to render this. Not bad. So we need to find a solution for this. But the problem is not finding a solution because the solution is pretty obvious, right? The solution is renderless things or hybridless things do less things. That's pretty easy and it's pretty obvious. But the challenge here is it wasn't to find a solution, but uh, to keep the things that we want to keep. Like, uh, I still want to keep my search engine optimization, right? I want to somehow still be able to crawlers to understand my website without passing all the rendering on the client. Uh, so I want my app to be optimized for Yandex or Googlebot. I still want to keep using React. I don't want to have different code base. I want to be something easy to understand and that everyone has the opportunity to use and it's flexible so the data is coming from the server but it's not that expensive on the client. Also, I want to keep my good user experience. I don't want to uh, see a skeleton. I don't want to show a placeholder or a spinner. I don't want our users to feel that the site is, is slow or that this is still loading or that something is missing. And definitely, we want to keep the developer experience because it's so important. I want a solution that is not hard to maintain or hard to use in our code base. So the solutions are not way too complicated to be used anywhere in any of our marketplace or even to remove them if in the future React has a better solution for this. So that's because we need the React render strategies. That's the point. We are going to see some strategies that are trying to keep all the things that were mentioned while it's improving the performance and is cutting some of the cost of the rendering our React application. We are gonna start with dynamic rendering. That's the first one of the strategies. So dynamic rendering is, uh, it means we are switching between clients are rendering and service are rendering content for a specific user agents. So if the user is a crawler, we are going to perform the full server side rendering or using a service like pre-render in order to return the static HTML from the server. But the, if the user is a human, if the user agent is from a client, a normal person, we are gonna send just the minimal HTML in order to render on the client the application. Still, there are two different variations of types of dynamic rendering. We have the first one by root, by the whole page, and the other one is by component. We are gonna talk first about by root. And imagine that we, have, we are Yandex with uh, the user agent. Um, 
the bot does a request to the server, and now a middleware is going to check if the user agent comes from the bot or a normal user. When the user agent is from a bot, like Yandex, requests from crawlers are route to a render service or even your server-side rendering. Um, and after that, if you have a server-side rendering or you are using a service like pre-render, we're going to do this and just send the pre-render application to the bot so they understand it. But if you are a normal user, what is going to happen is the middleware is going to check this and it's going to detect that you're a user and it's going to send the minimal HTML in order to, bot, to boot your application only on the client. So that would be the code, okay? That would be the code of the middleware on Express, like a Express uh, like middleware, we have the array of bot user agents in order to, to detect it. We are getting the index HTML with the minimal HTML that we need to, in order to start the application on the client. And this is the middleware. We need to extract the user agent from the request. We are going to transform it to lowercase in order to simplify how to compare with the user agents that we are comparing with. And if the requests come from a bot, what we are going to do is just pass to the next middleware, right? Then if the, uh, if the user agent is from a user, what we are going to do is just send the HTML with the minimal HTML. To use this middleware, and this is real production code, what we are going to do is to import or require this uh, middleware. And then, if the request comes from uh, a real user, we respond with the HTML. And if not, we go to the next middleware, that is the server side rendering middleware. So let's see a quick demo about this. As I said, we are using this in, uh, in production right now in the real estate marketplace. So in this example, we are a normal user. If I refresh the page, we could see here the size of the HTML that is pretty small, is three kilobytes. But if I change the user agent and I use the Googlebot user agent for mobile, and I refresh the page. We are sending the whole HTML for this response. You could see that now we are using 60 kilobytes. So the thing is that maybe you could feel it that if we are using the Google bot and I refresh, it's a bit slower. And maybe the, the, the feeling for the user is that it's, it's a bit more slow. But with the client side, we could do a better job. And it's more faster. At least we could show something before waiting for the whole full render from the server. And we could show the top bar. And we can show something. You could see that on the server side with the Google bot, we still have on the elements, we have the, all the iteration data that we need in order to boot the app on the client. But the thing with dynamic rendering is that it has a good fast time to first byte if you are using the client side rendering for the user. And the iteration data is gone for the client side if you are using only the client side, but not for the Google bot or Yandex bot. And you only need to do one change on the server side, and that's cool. You don't need to change anything else on your code base or your components. The bad thing is that this is still just a client surrendering for the user and it still has a bad first pain. If you think about it, it's still it's uh, something that uh, it's a bit tricky because you get black or white. It's, and it's still the Google bot or Yandex bot or any bot is getting the full cost of rendering your application. So you have to be careful about it. The good thing is that it's search engine optimization friendly and the thing that uh, a lot of thing, uh, people is asking sometimes is this, Yandex, does Yandex like it? Uh, because 
it seems that could be some kind of cloaking, right? It's like you are rendering some stuff for the server, and you are rendering a different thing for the client because it's an empty HTML. But on the Yandex documentation, you could find that uh, they mentioned that they want to be sure that they are able to read the, your content. So they are asking you to do a full render HTML. And they mentioned some ways to do it. And I'm pretty sure that as, as soon as you are returning on the server for the Google Bot or Yandex, uh, and on the client, you are doing exactly the same with the same content, but in different steps of rendering, you are fine. So this is a video where you could see the Yandex Webmaster tools that shows that this is working and they understand the HTML and everything is working smoothly with any change. You could see the whole HTML that is being rendered. And at the end, you get the hydration data. And they understand all the links that are there. The other question is, does Google like it? Because it's the other important uh, crawler that we have to be uh, sure that the crawler is understanding our website. And if you are concerned about this, you don't have to worry, because I hope it does. It's their idea, and still there are uh, a lot of documentation about this. This is a strategy that they invented. So about the question, is the dynamic rendering worth it? I would say that it depends you know, on, on the page. So it's something that you could experiment with in some routes, specific routes, as we are doing, and just check if it could be worth it. For sure, if you are not doing any kind of service or rendering, I recommend you as still to do a dynamic rendering and use some service like pre-render in order to pre-render your HTML, your application, and just to the crawler, send this application because if not, you are going to get troubles in order to be crawl faster. But I want to share with you the, I would say, the most interesting strategy with dynamic rendering. And it's doing this at component level. So this is the example that we saw before with server-side rendering with rehydration. We have a bunch of cars, and everything is getting uh, rendered from the server, and everything is getting irritated on the client. But with dynamic rendering at component level, we could do something like this. We could grab some components with a special component called dynamic rendering. And on the middle, we have the React components that we want to work with this specific strategy. The component that we are wrapping will be rendered on the server or not, depending if it's a bot or not. Let's check it out. This is our application for the bot. Everything is being rendered, and everything is in the HTML. But for the user, what is going to happen is that we are going to render the first card, because the first card is the only one that we are not grabbing with this dynamic rendering, because we want to make sure that the first card is uh, shown for the user, because it's critical. But the rest of them, they're going to be shown only when it's below the fall, it's above the, the fall. Okay? So every time that the scroll is passing to a new car or it's very near, what we are going to do for the users is to render this car. As for the last one and for every one of the cars. So we are cutting a lot of cost for rendering things that the user are not seeing. So how to use and how we implement this. How to use is pretty easy. We only have to grab the component that we want to avoid to be rendered for the user. Like this example, we have the dynamic rendering that is wrapping this anchor, that inside this anchor we have some component that is very complex to compute on the client. We have to pass as props the user agent because we are not doing this only on the server anymore. We are doing this in the server side and on the client side. So we need to calculate this user agent universally, so isomorphically. So this could be a kind of implementation of this component. This is a React component. We have uh, two props, the children and the user agent, uh, we have seen before. And we have to check if the user agent is a bot. So we have a method like the one that we saw in the middleware in order to check if the user agent is from a bot. And if it's a bot, we just return the children. That's it. 
But if it's not about what we are going to do, if, if we are on, a, on the client, we are going to grab with a lazy content, maybe with some intersection observer stuff in order to detect when the component is visible. And if we are on the server and it's a real user, we could render a placeholder. Uh, in this case, it's an, just an example in order to show you how it works. And we are rendering just an empty div with a border, but you could use a placeholder, pass by props, or maybe a manual placeholder that you could use. So I want to share with you a real use case scenario in production because we are using as well this strategy. This is a good example. This is the photo casa. This is the real estate marketplace. And how many cars could you see? One, right? And this is only one car, 700 pixels, visible for the user. But when the user is entering to the listing page, what is happening, it's kind of spectacular, OK? We are rendering 34 cars. And we are doing this not for the user, but because search engine optimization. So instead of doing this, rendering 20,000 pixels that the user maybe is not seeing, what we could do is to use dynamic rendering at component level in order to render only for the client the first car that is seen, and for the bots, render all the cars only to help them in order to crawl all the things. And this has a huge impact. In this case, without dynamic rendering, we could see that the cost in a normal CPU is half a second. But using dynamic rendering, we are using only 100 milliseconds. That's a huge reduction of the cost of rendering this without losing anything. So you could use it in your applications as well. Uh, this is a package that with this strategy. You could install it. You only have one requirement. You have to use React. You don't need any framework, no special needs. And it's fully compatible with Next.js. If you care about the bundle size, as I do, you don't have to worry. It's pretty small. Uh, it's one kilobyte. And it's even less if you don't need the intersection observer polyfill. So let's check a quick demo of dynamic rendering and component level. Let's check the, the dog. Oh, no. That wasn't dynamic. So <laughs> dynamic rendering at component level. Right. So I'm going to, ah, I was six slow down. I'm going to refresh. So remember, we had before the one second cost on the client to irritate the server-side rendering. So let's check now. Let's check. So now, the cost is of 300 milliseconds. OK? And are you seeing something different on the website? I guess not, right? It's exactly the same application that we have seen before. But if I scroll down and this is a dramatic effect. You don't need to be exactly like this. You could hide it better, but I want you to see exactly what is happening. If I scroll down, you see the next one? Because I has been faster enough in order to get the empty div, right? They are there. They are there. If I refresh and I uh, scroll faster, I can see that there are empty div HTML elements for the user. But if, if I navigate normally, I'm not going to notice that something is different. And the cool thing about this is not the user anymore. It's about the bot. So what is happening is that just by wrapping your React components, what you are getting is that Google bot or Yandex bot, if we refresh, the, they are going to get all the results rendered for free. 
Okay? You don't have to do any kind of differentiation between Googlebot or uh, a real user in anywhere but in your component. You could check if we refresh. And right now I'm a Googlebot user agent. I refresh and I can see all the elements that are rendered. You could see all the anchors for all the articles here. If, if I change to a real user and I refresh, what we are going to see is that the only the, th uh, the three first ones are rendered, and the rest of them are empty HTML. So the good thing about this is that it's not the whole route that is being black or white. It's like we are able, in order to achieve the best performance and keeping bots and crawlers happy, what we're going to do, we are gonna do is just to pre-render for Googlebot and Yandexbot what we want and we think that is important for them. It's still trying to jump. So <laughs> dynamic rendering and component level, good thing. We are improving the time to interactive and it's kind of lazy low for the user, but pretty easy to, to achieve. Bad things, we are keeping the hydration data there, still even when we don't need it, but it's, it would take a lot more effort to achieve this. We need a universal user agent calculation, and the bots still get the full cost of it. This is perfect for staff below default, and it's freeing resources from their server as well because we are cutting down some calculations on the first server for real users. So you may ask, uh, why do we need this? Because, well, as we have seen, Yandex need the full HTML in order to be crawled. But Googlebot has a new superb uh, bot that has some cool features in order to render all kind of clients are rendering. But as they work, it's not that easy. They first, uh, let me explain how the new Googlebot works, okay? First, the old-fashioned crawlers start crawling websites and index them, but at a later time, those index pages get rendered with the web render service of Google. But that could happen in one hour, two hours, two days, one week, never. Okay, it depends on your website, the popularity of your website, the number of pages of your website. Think that Google has like 100 trillion web pages to crawl, and it's not gonna take a lot of time in your website. It some another website is more important than yours. So be sure that if you want to be crawled fast and index faster, use service are rendering. Still, service are rendering is usually faster than clients are rendering. So, after learning things with dynamic rendering, we thought about what if we go further? So, let's meet another one strategy, the static rendering at component level. We have seen the cost of the hydration, right? The, all the things that we have to do. What if we avoid the cost of all of this on the client, right? So, how to use an implementation? We have a, a special component called static content. This component will allow us to just jump the irritation data on a specific tree of React components. In this case, imagine we have a huge, a huge list of links and we want just to don't hydrate them because we don't need interactivity, but we want to render them from the server. Now, how the static content works? We have this component, the static content, with uh, the prompt is the children that is wrapping. And just if we are on the server, we just render the content in order to provide the HTML static string. But if we are on the client, what we're going to do is to avoid the hydration by using a kind of two special props, OK? We are going to use the dangerously set inner HTML and the surprise hydration warning. Let me explain you about the first one. So in a pull request, uh, Sebastian Markbech, a core contributor of React, uh, mentioned that if you set the dangerous set in an HTML to an empty string or a null value, what React is going to do on the client is just skip the component. 
And that's just what we want. He said that is something definitely hacky, though. So you have to be kind of uh, with warm. But well, this is like we are hackers right now. Okay. And how about the, the other prop is only in order to avoid any console noise with the problems with the mismatch from the server and on the client because we are forcing this mismatch. Okay. So let's check a quick static rendering demo. <laughs> okay, so this is exactly the same uh, the same application. You could see uh, I want to to show you something with the server cycle with client hydration. As you could see that every article has a special like fade in. This is happening in the component did mount. Okay, so when the image is being in the, well, not now, but you could see that there are some kind of uh, specific interactivity. For example, I could uh, read more, clicking here. So there are some interactivity. The thing with static content, and we are going to check the performance tab again. We are going to refresh. So now the, the cost of, uh, of this is even less, 200 milliseconds. Uh, the thing is that this is great because we are cutting uh, some cost of, on the client, but we are losing completely the interactivity. So you have to be completely sure where, where are you using this strategy, right? You could see here that the fade-in is not longer working because this is using an effect in order to do this. And the, when I'm hovering on the article, I'm not getting the read more, OK? So this is a very cool strategy for things that you want to be sure that you don't need interactivity, OK? For us, for example, was using a huge list of links, search engine optimization links, in order to, with 100 results, that we were server side rendering them, and on the client we had a huge cost for it. So we are cutting down all, all the cost. So it's great, but it has some drawback. Okay. We are avoiding the rehydration for static components, and it's improving greatly the time to interactive. We are losing the interactivity. This is the great drawback. You have to be very careful with it, but the integration data is still there. So it's still, as well, open source. You could use it, only one requirement, use React, and fully compatible with Next.js, as all the demos that you are seeing are made with Next.js framework. It's pretty small, the, the package is uh, half kilobyte. But after this, we thought, can we do it better? Can we do it progressive? I mean, the static content is great, but what if we could get a new strategy. By using this idea of static rendering, of avoiding the hydration, but using the dynamic rendering approach of rendering the components that are visible for the user, but instead rendering from scratch, what if we could hydrate the components when they are visible? So this is going to happen. We are going to grab the component. We, we are just uh, grabbing the component that we want to be progressive hydrated. And what we're going to get from the server is just the static HTML string for this specific component. For example, for the car, the static HTML. But as soon as the component is visible for the user, it gets hydrated. And every time that a component is visible, is being hydrated. So this is progressive hydration. And how to use it? Pretty simple. You only have to wrap the component that you want to use this specific strategy, like a car. You don't need any more to care about user agents. And that's great, more uh, simple to maintain. And this is a kind of implementation, easy implementation of this strategy. 
So we have to get a reference of the element that we want to hydrate it later. Uh, we have a hook here in order to know when this reference is near the screen. We have then a use effect, like a effect that is going to be executed only on the client. And if the element is near the screen, what we are going to do is to manually call the hydrate method of React DOM that we have seen before. And we are going to hydrate the children on the container, the ref.current, that is the container that is holding the HTML static string. And this is going to happen only when it's near the screen. So this effect is going to be executed when the children is changing or when it's near the screen. On the server, we are going to do the static content strategy. We are just sending the HTML string. And on the client as well, we are doing exactly the static rendering strategy. We are suppressing the hydration step using that hack that we have seen before. So about Vue, if you may ask, because some of you vote uh, with Vue, you have some uh, solutions for it that are pretty, pretty great. The lazy hydration, hydration and Vue lazy hydration, they are pretty similar. They share some code base. They are very simple, simple API, plug and play. I like them very much because they have configurable interactions, interactions in order to hydrate the components. This is an ex a quick example. It's like you have the opportunity to configure when the component is going to get hydrated. Like when, is, when your main thread is idle, when you, you only want to get the server side rendering, like a static content, when it's visible, when the user is interacting with the component. With Angular, well, I, 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 nobody asked, but <laughs> still, they are working on something called progress fifth loading. Uh, they want to put it on the library, and the framework is pretty awesome, but it still is not mature enough. And, and React, you have different uh, uh, solutions for it. You have React pre-render component. It's uh, it's similar, it's not exactly the same idea. They have a partial iteration at component level caching, but the problem is very powerful, but the problem for us is that it was very complex to maintain and to, to use it, okay? There is an experiment from Google uh, that is called React Progressive Hydration. It's the same name of the strategy. I think it's very interesting to, to check it out because they have interesting ideas. But for us, it was uh, quite experimental and a bit uh, complex to use it. And it wasn't prepared to use out the box. And obviously, you have my package as well, <laughs> uh, progressive hydration. The only thing and the most big drawback of this is that as we are using the hydrate method, what is happening is that we are breaking the tree connectivity Okay, in React. So if you are using context, uh, you are gonna be, you are gonna need to grab again the the tree with your context. Okay, you have to be careful with it. So let's do a quick demo of this progressive hydration. Oh, sorry. So progressive hydration, hydration. This one. Let's this and refresh. Now, we're getting, as you can see, far less uh, than the service are rendering, 350, uh, 350 milliseconds. But the cool thing is that everything is there. If, we, if I check the elements and I check the section, I could see that everything is grabbed by a diff element. But if we, I check the last one, the HTML string is going to be there. So definitely, the crawlers are going to understand this. But the thing is that if I record this, every time that, that I scroll down, I'm going to see that the hydration is happening after. And what I'm achieving is just separating every hydration. So 
I'm avoiding the problem with server side rendering with, with rehydration, that we are getting all the, the app hydrated at once. And what we're doing here is to hydrate on demand. So I can see here, if I'm able to, what I'm seeing here is that every time that I scroll down, I'm getting a specific car hydrated from the HTML string that I'm returning from the server. And the cost of it is very small, as we have seen. It's only 20 milliseconds and 30 milliseconds, so the user is not going to notice it. And as uh, the dynamic rendering we had to render from scratch, what is happening here is that the user is not noticing any placeholder or anything because the HTML is there. And it's actually the content that we need for the user but it's static until we hydrated them. Oh, so, progressive hydration. We have seen the, the good things, the drawbacks, and you have as well the package, pretty small. So, I don't have time to talk to you about the what's next, but there are something uh, uh, good uh, things about React. They are working on it because we have some drawbacks right now, as we have seen with server side rendering. Um, with suspense, I expect that we are going to get first class support for some of the strategies that we have seen. And we mentioned some of the React Conf. They have some kind of React uh, progressive hydration that is totally different as the one that they mentioned here. Okay, it's because you have you could stream from the server and hydrate while you are sending the stream over from the server to the client. It's a different thing as we have seen here. And that's the progressive hydration. As you're streaming the response, you are hydrating. It's different. We are hydrating only on demand of the user. And they have the selective hydration that I think is pretty cool. So they hydrate. It's something too similar. The selective hydration is what we are doing. But what we could do is to hydrate only the part that the user, the user is going to need. Like, uh, they want to click on something, they're going to just hydrate that part. And you could try to play with it, enable, enabling concurrent mode. So uh, how have we achieved this, the question of the beginning? We use the dynamic rendering to cut off two seconds of time to interactive and start the rendering for one second more. And it's right, React could be a slow, uh, but now you have different strategies to fix it, and most importantly, very, use to, uh, very, use, very use, easy strategies to use in your applications, right? You only have to grab your, app, your component that you want to try and just check the performance tab in order to see the impact. All the strategies and the demos that you have seen, there, are, uh, there is a repository on GitHub. This is the QR code with all the links and all the resources, with all the slides, all the packages, and all the GIF that you have seen <laughs> as well. This is my Twitter, Mirudev. If you want to share some thoughts, you want to ask any question, you have any comment, feedback, anything, it would be great to talk with you or in the discussion zone. And that's all. Spasiva. Uh, so thank you for a great uh, talk. I thanks. believe we have just time for a couple of questions. Oh, take sure. a seat. Pick the favorite one. <laughs> this, this one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one question which was asked multiple times wow. in different versions <laughs> uh, is pretty simple. How does search engines tolerate that you're serving different content to them and to user? Yeah. Because like you're rendering free cards to the user, but 34 to search engines. Isn't it clocking or would yeah. you eventually be banned? Yeah, so uh, the first thing is that, as you have seen, the dynamic rendering that is used, using this uh, is invented by Google. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's invented by Google because there is a necessity of, of this, of having a separating thing. What Google is saying you is that you have to be sure that the content that you are sending is the same. 
But what is not saying you is how do you render the content? Ah. What is the problem that you could face? Imagine if you are a Google bot and you are sending no three cars or 35, but an article with some specific links in order to try to trick uh, the crawler. Mm -hmm. And on the client, then you show the cars. That is different content. But in this specific case, it's not different content. It's a different ways to render the same content. That's it. And that's the important thing. You have to make sure that the content that you're rendering is the same. Another question is pretty trivial that uh, each and is obvious for anyone who tried any server side rendering. How do you deal with all these uh, different approaches to rendering with a common problem like not everything in JavaScript, not everything is React, is server side rendering compatible? Uh, so we need to do some fancy window checks, wrapping in uh, client side only components and so on. Uh, are there any additional problems introduced by using this other ways of the rendering? Yeah, so um, that's super important. I mean, um, when we started looking for solutions, we wanted to be sure that they were easy to implement, easy to remove, and they didn't break anything. So. Uh, obviously, you have to check if you are on the server, if you are on the client, but the examples that you have seen, they are totally compatible on server and client. They are not getting any more problems with anything, but uh, it's only, it's typical. I mean, we are already doing some service are rendering that on the client, we are using life cycles or use effect in order to do more things on the client. So it's something similar. I, I don't see, it's not adding any more troubles in this case. So we're not doing anything else. Okay, and probably very last question okay. before uh, you will move to the discussion zone. Uh, the question is that you are uh, very concerned about computational power optimizations, like this, you are saving the CPU resource as the main one. What about other resources, like memory usage for server-side rendering and so on? Yeah, so um, I wanted to focus to show you the strategies, but um, so we are using obviously node you know, on the server. And um, we found that not only we are freeing resources for the CPU, but the number of requests that we're able to handle after using the progressive hydration, for example, uh, the dynamic rendering is pretty huge because the listing is the main page that is visited by our users. Um, we have millions of visits. So after this, after using the dynamic rendering, we are like doubling the number of requests that we are able to handle with the same resources. So we are not only freeing the CPU, but the main thread, uh, memory, because there's uh, uh, less impact to the memory as well. So you have benefits for everything, not only the CPU. Great. OK, thanks again for great thanks talk. You. So get ready for a discussion in discussion zone. <laughs> OK, and thank you. For every one of you, see you in one hour, I believe. Awesome.